All right. Everyone, good evening. Welcome to our first session on Jesus and the Disinherited by Howard Thurman. Uh, arguably considered, uh, Howard Thurman himself considered to be kind of the spiritual mentor of many civil rights leaders um, of the 60s and 70s. Um, his book, Jesus and the Disinherited, that we're studying is arguably considered to be kind of the grounds of which the entire civil rights movement had its kind of spiritual foundation and theological foundation for much of what we've seen, uh, much of what we've been discussing in the letter from a Birmingham jail. And so uh, for our time tonight, uh, we will be studying at least the middle portion of the book, uh, which is where art, what's been called the hounds of hell, what Howard himself calls the three hounds of hell, which is fear, deception, and hatred. How that is a reality that really plagues many people who are considered oppressed or the disinherited, as Howard would say. So we will start our session today in a prayer, which is a prayer reflection by Howard himself. <coughs> and we'll go into a video um, and this is a video that is that was made by PBS in, 20, in 2019. Um, it's a fantastic uh, biography, a, a bio-op about Howard um, that has leaders like John Lewis. It has leaders like Otis Moss III. Um, we'll, be re we'll be watching about 16 minutes of it. It's a real good foundational piece for us to consider before we get into the book. Um, because if you don't... We're aware of Martin Luther King. Howard Thurman is always a bit more elusive for folks to understand if you don't, under, if you don't know his work and his life. So um, let's pray. This is from his meditations from the human heart. Uh, the Lord be with you. Awesome. Uh, God, we seek the strength to overcome the tendency to evil in our own hearts. Uh, we recognize the tendency to do the unkind thing when the mood of retaliation or revenge rides high in our spirit. We recognize the tendency to yield to fear and cowardice when fear, fearlessness and courage seem to fit easily into the pattern of our security. Uh, we seek, oh God, uh, the strength to overcome the evil that is present all around us. Uh, we seek the strength to overcome and not be overcome by evil. And we seek to be purified, to, we seek the purification of our own hearts, the purging of our own motives. We seek the strength to withstand the logic of bitterness, the terrible divisiveness of hate, the demonic triumph of the conquest of others. What we seek for ourselves and what we desire with all our heart is for our friend and foe to be family alike. God, we ask this, and we ask the strength to overcome evil. Amen. All right. So, let me control. Okay. One second while I... Get this ad out. <laughs> okay, I will now share screen. Is it go to sound optimize share? All right, can, can you all see this uh, YouTube video? You might wanna make it larger for us though. All right, well, let me just quickly just play this. All right. He was born. All right, can we hear that? Yes. All right. I will go full screen and... Born the grandson of slaves, yet Howard Thurman would become one of the most celebrated religious figures of the 20th century. A spiritual mentor to Martin Luther King Jr. Whether we want it that way or not, we're all tied together. 
and a moral anchor for the civil rights movement. Martin Luther King Jr. would quote Howard Thurman on many, many occasions. I think Howard Thurman, for many leaders in that movement, King included, played the role of pastor. In the 1930s, after an historic meeting with Mahatma Gandhi, Thurman becomes one of the early voices for nonviolent resistance for a people who over centuries experienced unimaginable violence. He helped to establish the philosophical framework of how to struggle. He saw himself as a spiritual activist because he was fundamentally a teacher. He had this combination of, of being kind and being strong, and I think that's a very rare combination. While Sunday morning was often considered the most segregated hour in the week, Thurman helped pioneer a church where people of different races and religions could worship together. He's suspicious of denomination and dogma and creed. He would never identify himself as a theologian because he thought theologians boxed God. And he was called a mystic because he believed religious experience was best explored within. Howard Thurman was actually practicing contemplative spirituality before we actually started calling it contemplative spirituality. <laughs> At his heart, he was a, a nature mystic. Thurman is talking to trees. Trees. <laughs> Yet this mystic was also an outspoken critic of Christianity for its part in the nation's deep racial divides. And he countered with a shocking new work that offered a revolutionary new way of understanding the life of Jesus Christ and how it speaks directly to the oppressed and disinherited. I carry the book with me, Jesus and the Disinherited, every day. And he gives an Africanity to the interpretation of Jesus. He provided a, a spiritual perspective that was empowering. There were people encountering Thurman's work and being shaken at their core. I would have to find out what was the word that the religion of Jesus had to say to the man with his back against the wall. All right. Let me quickly go through this ad here. Major funding for this program was provided by Lilly Endowment. You will find true success and happiness if you have only one goal. There really is only one, and that is this, to fulfill the highest, most truthful expression of yourself. Theologian Howard Thurman said it best. He said, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and then go do that. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. The 1960s and the civil rights movement is exploding across America. A century after a civil war was fought to end slavery, Deeply rooted segregation and blatant racism are still legal in many parts of the nation. Now they're being met head on. I may be poor, but I am somebody. I may be uneducated, but I am somebody. Jesse Jackson, Martin Luther King Jr., John Lewis, Otis Moss Jr., Vernon Jordan, and other civil rights leaders are convinced the moment for resistance has come. And no matter how they are treated, they are committed to nonviolence. The spirit in man is not easily vanquished. It is fragile and tough. You may fail again and again, and yet something will not let you give up. Something keeps you from accepting no as a final answer. It is this quality that makes for survival of values when the circumstances of one's life are most against decency, goodness, and right. They were given the power and the authority to respond to the realities of injustice in ways that could be true to their faith, 
and in ways that um, did not require them to compromise the integrity of who they were. Many feel it is Howard Thurman, through his insights and early commitment to nonviolence, who evokes a spirit felt across the entire movement. Whether we want it that way or not, we all tied together. Every Negro in America is a little white, and every white man in America is a little Negro. The Negro needs the white man to save him from his fears, and the white man needs the Negro to save him from his guilt. We need each other. People sometimes seem to think that nonviolence was very endemic to the African-American community as a way of life, when in fact it was not. And even Thurman is very clear that nonviolence was a kind of a cultivated experience for most rank and file people, including leadership. I would agree that Howard Thurman was a saint of the movement. He gave us the basis for the march that we know why we march, the principles upon which we march, how we march, and what we do after the march. He helped to establish the philosophical framework for our, of how to struggle. You cannot let the oppressor break your spirit, then make it break your bones or your arms, but not your spirit. That's the stuff of, of Howard Thurman. Dr. King was not completely committed to nonviolence. When I say not committed, he saw it first as a tactic until he was fully converted to it as a lifestyle. And, and my father helped me with that to, to understand that early on, people saw things as a tactic. This is the best way. Dr. King then moves to this is a lifestyle. And that is a direct connection to Thurman's conversion. And here is a nonviolent revolutionary. One of the foundational works for the movement is a book by Thurman, Jesus and the Disinherited. I have been told that Dr. King carried Jesus and the Disinherited with him most of the time when he traveled. It's a book that really describes what it means to be involved in such a struggle as a spiritual matter, as a matter of faith, and not just the effort to change laws for the gaining of civil rights. He says that the African Americans didn't have any rights, just like Jesus, but they could choose to ground themselves in their own inherent dignity and worth. And if one were to choose this, it would have a lot to do with how they would deal with the question of what do you do when your back is against a wall. The paradox is that Thurman, who has wide impact on the movement, is not himself first a social reformer. He's much more a spiritual contemplative, what some would even call a mystic. Howard Thurman is a great example of making the connection between contemplation and social justice. But the mystic himself is not out on the front lines during many of the marches. And for that, he's often criticized. He was the teacher, he was the, the mentor, he was the spiritual sage. He was not the one who was on the front line, but he was the one where people would retreat to, uh, to be refilled. They were praying for a great freedom fighter, a liberator. One of them said, you know, we thought we had a Moses, and we ended up with a mystic. Howard Thurman determined his role as opposed to having people telling him what to do with it. To be independent, to be free, to be available. For Thurman, one of the great tragedies is that too often on both sides of the racial front lines are Christians. Historically, many churches and denominations suffered deep and painful divisions over issues of race. And Sunday morning is often described as the most segregated hour in America. China is the great... All right, give me one second here. I think that's a good stopping point for us. Let me stop the share for right now. Yeah, so... 
essentially what this book plays out is, is it describes for, not just for Howard, but the way that Howard begins to see what does it mean for a post-World War II society to grapple with the question of race and race in the way that it is constructed in community um, and the way that it is expressed internally. Because a lot of, if you've read the book, you've noticed there's a lot of kind of like a, psycholo a psychology of the oppressed. And so a lot, of, a lot of what Howard is trying to say and a lot of what's in the background of, of Thurman's work is what happens in, in the interior, what happens within the soul and the self has ramifications for outside. So in order for society to be changed, I must be the first one to be changed, right? And that's kind of similar, what we talked about last time uh, when we were trying to talk about Gandhi's approach to nonviolent uh, nonviolence and a nonviolent protest movements in, in India, it's the same kind of idea that the self is a part of this much wider cosmic reality, the oneness of creation. And so in order for the oneness to be restored and to be, to be kind of together, the, the, the oneness of humanity requires that I address what is wrong within me. Um, and so that's kind of where our discussion leads us today is to ask uh, and to really join with Howard in wondering what is truly at fault? What is truly wrong with the way that the oppressed and the oppressor are relating to themselves? And how does that, uh, how does that exist within the human soul? Um, so let me share the screen and I wanna talk a little bit more about the context of the book itself. So this quote that you see here on your left-hand side is from this book by, by Peter Eisenstadt, uh, Against the Hounds of Hell. And he makes this excellent point that for us to really understand Jesus and the his, Disinherited, we have to see it as this. It's a book of Southern memory, both of Thurman's memories and, of tho and those of others. It was an account of how African-Americans, like his beloved oak tree, buffeted, battered, but not breaking in the storm, came to understand and creatively respond to the realities of their social and political oppression. So again, there's, there's a lot of stories. There's a lot of, there's a lot of little kind of narrative quips that we see all throughout the book. And that's because Howard is going to take these, these stories of his childhood, the stories of his youth, which we'll be talking about next week, and using those as, as points of departure, points of insight. Um, and so where does, where does he really begin in terms of his own grappling with his, with his, with his, own, um, his own memory, his own memory in relation to his ministry? Uh, we see that first and foremost um, in the 1920s um, as, as he's, he's, he's at Howard University I mean, he's grappling with the question of what does it mean, what does Christianity really mean for African Americans? And so he's really corresponding with one of his colleagues who ends up being, if I remember, I think it was the president of Howard University, um, Mordecai Wyatt Johnson. And he comes up with this idea that, that really what we're hearing, what he sees in the life of Jesus is he, is he sees the good news of the disinherited. In, in what Jesus does, in, in what Jesus teaches, um, and Jesus's disposition towards Romans and, 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 and religious leaders uh, with, that we see within the Gospels. So this is a Jesus that's not the Jesus of the Council of Nicaea. This is what we call the, the historical Jesus, uh, the Jesus that lived and breathed that, that isn't at this point, at least for Howard, and this is one of his main, one of the main criticisms that people leveled against Howard, um, is that this isn't the Jesus who is fully divine and fully human. So this is, this is simply the, 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 the human Jesus, because again, Howard's concern is right there, how, how does the life of Jesus help the oppressed answer to, the, to their pressing concern 
of what of to really exist and participate in society. So 1920s, he has a manuscript of this idea of the good news of the disinherited, but it isn't until 39, 1939, that while he's giving lectures, six lectures in Canada, that he, he realizes, I think I'm onto something and really finally distilling, you can imagine how many years of, of insight. And he, and he writes, he titles these lectures, The Significance of Jesus, and he tries to get them published. And, and at the time, um, I think it was Schreiber um, Publishing House decides, you know, there's too many books named The Significance of Jesus. Um, we're not interested in, in that particular um, set of reflections. And so it's, it's, it's not until Howard goes and moves to San Francisco after World War II in, in, in 44, actually. He's there in 44, but he's really writing the, the foundations for Jesus and the disinherited, the actual text itself um, that we have here in about 44, 45. So about post, we're moving into post-war uh, America. And so at this time, he's the pastor of this church for the fellowship of all people. You might have seen that small reference in the, in the biop pick or the biop that we have there. But this is, he's, he's co-pastoring at this time and he's, he's creating an innovative community that just put yourself in this sexual and in, in this situation 1945 this church of the fellowship for all people is is really located in an area that um was predominantly made of people of japanese heritage and so it's it's interesting to see that in in 44 and 45 howard and the pastoral team at the church for the fellowship of all people are intentional about welcoming Japanese folks that had just come back from the internment camps uh, and put them in a sense uh, as, as, as a, a, put them in, in positions of power and in positions of leadership at this congregation. And so he writes in, in 1945, a series of poems that it, the collection is called the greatest of these um, that for him refines a lot of what it means for the disinherited to, to live, not just out of the great wealth of the Christian tradition, but out of the great insight um, that Jesus brings for the disinherited. And if you read in, in the section on hate, page 78, he, he, makes re he makes reference to one of the poems of his collection here, um, which I'll mention that poem later on in the, in the discussion. But it's, it's really not until he finishes writing and publishing Deep River in 1947 that Howard really begins to think about this piece of work, this Jesus and the Disinherited, as a, as a work that needs to be published, as a work that is not only based off of these, these poems, these, the, his, rich, his own rich vignettes of his own life, but is actually based off of many of the spirituals of, of, of the African-American tradition that for him, uh, he found that it were, they were immensely descriptive of what it means for the oppressed to find, to find significance, to find a sense of being and of self and of integrity in the midst of, of, of slavery. And so, Any questions up to this point? Uh, let me just stop sharing screen. Any questions up to this point about kind of the, the where this book comes from? This book essentially has three streams of his own life, his own, his own uh, academic work, and as well this, this, his own publishing history um, of poetry and of spirituals. Any questions? Uh, Jim, please. Was he affiliated with a, a, a church body, a national church body? Was he a Methodist or a Baptist or a? Excellent point. Uh, no, when he so when he's a when he's a so before he takes he's he's he has several university chaplain positions. So Howard's first call was to I think oh, what was the university? He was called to 
to be a, a university chaplain. I forgot the first university. The second university was Boston, Boston University. He was the chaplain there. But he wasn't, he wasn't affiliated with a national organization. Um, he, he did, um, in the 1930s, uh, tie himself to the YMCA. So if anything, he has real strong connection to the YMCA. When him and his wife, Sue Bailey, go to India, it's because they're on a, uh, a visit of, of welcome and of learning that was sponsored by the YMCA. Um, so there isn't, that he isn't a Baptist, he isn't a Methodist, he is part of this wider non-denominational, intercultural, uh, inter, interdenominational, and yet interfaith kind of a movement um, that really marks Howard for who he is. Did he do his uh, theological studying in, at Howard or did he, he went, elsewhere? He went, to, he went to this small seminary called Rochester, the Rochester Seminary in New York. And it was, he was one of two African-American students at the seminary. Um, this particular seminary was predominantly white. And by the time Howard had started his seminary studies, they had allowed for um, only two African-Americans to, to, to go into seminary studies every year. Um, so yes, excellent point, Bruno. He went all the way north to Chicago, uh, all the way north to, to New York City, or not New York City, to New York to, to get his theological education. Uh, Joe? Oh, you're still muted, Joe. All right, let me see. I'm gonna, there we go. I was trying just to do the space bar. Um, uh, it does say that he was ordained as a Baptist minister in um, mm -hmm. while he was at Rochester. So some of his background is Baptist. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Any other comments, questions? Well, while I'm unmuted, um, I just watching that video makes me look back on my journey along this. And I've been so blessed uh, both being in Atlanta and also with my time up at Chautauqua. But many of those people that were on the video, I've had personal encounters with, uh, you know, uh, Otis Moss the mm third -hmm. and John Lewis was, has been, you know, um, was my representative uh -huh. for years and years. And so it, it just kind of, I, I never even knew about Howard Thurman and yet how he had influenced so many of the people. And Ellison too is at Candler right now and I, I took a class under him. Oh, good. Yeah. All right. Okay, let me continue on share. All right, current slide. So Howard, says this wonderfully, it's one of my favorite lines, fear is one of the persistent hounds of hell that dog the footsteps of the poor, the dispossessed, and the disinherited. So Howard begins his reflection by talking about the nature of fear. So fear as not just simply uh, something that, that is innocuous, something that is that's purely psychological, but really deals with, with fear uh, that's relational. Um, fear that, uh, um, that in itself um, is, comes about as a result of inequities. Um, as he says in, in, in page 27, but when power and the tools of violence are on one side, the fact that there is no available and recognized protection from violence makes the resulting fear deeply terrifying. So uh, in essence, what he's saying is that disinherited um, are, experiences fear because there is a sense in which there is a lack of dignity. There's a lack of, uh, of, uh, of protection from, from, any, from any meaningful interactions uh, and interactions that are not based off of violence. So there's, there's a sense in which, as he says in, in page 28, 
In such physical violence, the contemptuous disregard for personhood is the fact that is degrading. So he's saying is that th this, 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 this reality of fear in the disinherited it is so pervasive within the human soul that it really transforms the way that the disinherited begin to see themselves. That they begin to kind of, in a way, um, find that their personhood is under attack. Um, and it's under attack because they are in a position which they don't have any defense. Um, and he makes this, this interesting kind of a comparison between uh, the disinherited and, and, the, and, and the strong of society, the, the, in, in the sense that the white people of society and the story of David and Goliath. Um, but it's interesting because he, he kind of says this, the, the, the disinherited are kind of like Goliath who, who has this, this apoplexy because he is completely shocked by the fact that there wasn't an equal partner for him to fight. There was a sense in which his own dignity, his sense as a, as a warrior was disregarded because David was there with a slingshot and that's it, you know? And that's what, what Howard is trying to say is not that to say that the disinherited are Goliaths, but rather that there is there is this, this kind of a sense in which the disinherited uh, on account of fear um, are seen as lesser than others. And so for, for Howard, he sees that it's something that's within the self um, and that's, that, that, that is conditioned. So it's something that, that, the, that the oppressed are constantly finding themselves trying to navigate the world by, by really managing the sense of fear within themselves. As in, in, in page 30, he, he relates how when he was in India, he had to teach himself um, you know, to, 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 to shine the light every time he wanted to go out in the middle of the evening so that he would be prepared if, should there be a snake, should there be a cobra, should there be anything on the ground that could potentially basically kill him. And so what Howard is saying is this pervasive fear is such that, that the disinherited begin to alter their way of living, their alter their, their patterns of behaving with each other in a way to mitigate that fear. Um, and I think this, this quote here that I have on page 32 best describes this. He says, all over the world, wherever ghettos are found, the same basic elements appear. Basically the same reality of fear appears when there are the weak versus the strong, the, the, the disinherited versus the, 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 the powerful of society. He says, a fact which dramatizes the position of weakness and gives the widest possible range to the, to the policing effect of fear generated by the threat of violence. And so Howard, Howard goes along to say that, see what segregation does is that, is that segregation breeds fear. It, it, it breeds fear because it doesn't allow for a sense of intimacy to be there between the weak and the strong. And, then, and, it's, and, it, and it does it in such a way that it, it reinforces this, 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 this denigration, uh, the sense that one is insignificant in the world. Um, and so for, for Howard, he sees this, there's a conscious and this unconscious kind of imbibing of this fear. Uh, it's something in which there has to be, there must be something that Jesus has said about fear that helps us understand, or at least helps the disinherited gain a sense of dignity, a sense of, of personhood uh, that doesn't debilitate one's own, own emotional reserves. And so starting on page 37, Howard begins to show through, through particular verses of the scriptures, what, what, is, what is Jesus really trying to tell those who are on the underside of society, the disinherited? What is he trying to tell them in terms of the great strength there is in the Lord? So he, he, uh, he begins with this quotation from Isaiah, from, from Luke chapter 6, which is a quotation from Isaiah 61. Now the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach deliverance to the captives 
the recovering of sight to the blind, to set liberty them that are bruised, to preach, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and he began to say to them, this day the scripture is fulfilled in your ears. So then he poses that. But he brings out again the Magnificat in that famous part, one of my favorite verses in the Magnificat. He has scattered the proud in the imaginations of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of, lowly, of low degree. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent empty away. He says, these are, these are the words that, that Jesus is saying that there's that, that God is, is making it so that the conditions that the disinherited are experiencing, that God is rectifying those experiences. And so this sense in which God is in control, that God is, 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 is making a new way forward, Howard really brings it out when he, when he says this in, in, in chapter 10 of Matthew, where he's in the same page, page 37. Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not be known. And fear them not which kill the body, but are able to kill the soul. And then further on. Um, are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are more valuable than many sparrows. So what Howard is essentially saying is what Jesus speaks to the disinherited is he speaks this sense that humanity specifically the humanity that are disinherited are children of god because god has made them god is clothing them god is changing the the the, the situations of desperation and hopelessness in the situations of life and he says that very very clearly, and I, right, I have that quote there. The core of the analysis of Jesus is that man is a child of God, the God of life that sustains all nature and guarantees all the intricacies of the life processes itself. So he says, if understanding that we are children of God, right, then the first thing that we have to understand once we have that in our minds is that there is nothing in this world that will destroy us that that because i because there is a sense within within us that we have been made and and formed to be children of god he says that stabilizes the ego because no longer are you seen as insignificant but you're seen as 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 complete as made whole as made fully in the image of the creator and that's that's a really strong theme in howard is the creator who has made all things is concerned about myself, about my whole self. And so he, he goes on and, and really I commend the rest of the pair of, uh, the rest of the, this chapter to you, but it's important to keep in mind that for Howard, that reality that we are children of God stabilizes the self because fear again is this, is this, this, crippling sense that you're insignificant that you're worthless that you don't have you don't have a leg to stand on and howard and howard says the strength in in our faith in the strength that is found in jesus is that insight that you are a beloved child of god so there is nothing in this world that can tell you otherwise and so he 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 says he ends this chapter with this wonderful story uh with his mother um, when he watched Haley's comment and, and he asked this kind of a, kind of a matter of factly question of his mother, as he saw, as he sees the comet just kind of pass in, in the night sky, he says, what will happen to us if the comet falls out of the sky? Again, you hear Howard is, is trying to trying to show us what happens if all of a sudden the very world that we live in becomes insignificant nothingness because there's been utter destruction his mother says something that i think howard is trying to bring out when he says that at the core of the analysis of jesus is that man is a child of god he says this he says when my mother spoke she said 
nothing will happen to us, Howard. God will take care of us. Um, and here, Howard says, here, here is exactly, here and page 47, here are the faith and the awareness that overcome fear and transform it into the power to strive, to achieve, and not to yield. And so for at least at this point in our discussion, um, here's the question. Um, how is fear cultivated by the oppressed? Um, and how is this fear related to, to how we live in life? How do we participate in life? How we participate in the church or in politics? Um, how, is, how, does, how is this fear related to our participation in the world itself? Um, so I'm going to stop the share here and open the floor to discussion. Uh, Lisa. Well, he says on page 32, most of the accepted social behavioral patterns assume segregation to be normal. If normal, then correct. If correct, then moral. If moral, then religious. Religion is thus made a defender and a guarantor of the presumptions. So that's, I mean, that's one way that fear is perpetuated. Others. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, uh, Randy, uh, the, uh, Bridget? The, uh, the self-examination doesn't only need to be on an individual basis. However, that is uh, necessary for all of us. But as a society, um, we need to give a description of what's going on. So where is the oppression taking place? Uh, is it uh, in, uh, well, being a woman, I, you know, look at how there are so many keys in authority, or the, the male domination of that. Um, doesn't exactly make you fearful, but uh, how do you structure your life in the light of what's dominant around you? Um, I've just read a book about a man that fled technology and uh, he didn't succeed very well. It's kind of hard in this day and age, as I know, since I am not very technologically educated um but uh, i think we we need to look at our society or the world as we would call it and uh, see what elements in it do we have a do we have symbols of class is class a bad thing not a bad thing but an evil thing well, I guess you could say that most of the same. But anyway, those are just some thoughts about looking at from a sociological standpoint. Um, I thought about it deeply in the survey that we're taking for uh, the meeting that Christ the King is going to be having on the 26th. When it talked about growth, I thought, how do you define growth. It means one thing to one person and one thing to another. And to me, I think I looked at it. That's why I really like this about uh, Thurman. Um, because his introspection was very mystical and very to the heart of the matter. Um, Thanks for bringing these things up. Thank you, Bridget. Uh, Susan, please, and, and then Jim. To the, the particular question, how does fear become cultivated by the oppressed? And that there's two things I can bring to mind that ha have happened in my world. 
Um, I want to share the fear because if you get, if you escape, then you've gotten a better position than I have. And I don't like that. So uh, if I was in the oppressed and I see someone that's like me escaping and getting ahead, then I might uh, figure out a way to retaliate or something. And then the, the other place is what fear can also be cultivated by a, nothing less than a, a sense of protection. Um, that the community is, uh, I don't wanna say anything, I don't wanna do anything, I don't wanna behave in any way because I'll get retaliated on just like my friend over there that did. So the both of those I could see how, I never thought of the oppressed cultivating fear, but I could I could make up some facts that could do that. Well, I can, I'll, I'll... I'll, I'll make a comment and then I'll go with Jim, but you see, in my own, in my own experience, you know, as a, as a Latin American man and as, as children of immigrants, it's, I have, I have found when I, when I talk with my other colleagues, my other Latino colleagues, that there, there is a sense in which it, it's, it, it's, it can be a bit of a challenge to talk about my own experience because it, in, in a way, the challenges I, it's been difficult for me to talk about the, my experiences as a child because I've, had, I've been in situations where when I've tried to, uh, there was a sense in which I was ostracized. There was a sense in which we don't wanna hear about how this articulate Latin man uh, in himself, as kind as he is, is much more intelligent than I am. That's what happened in Indiana. When I was in Indiana, um, they made fun of me every single day for being Mexican. Uh, had an accent. I was on the other side of the border, and so what I, what what I had to do in my own self was to protect myself. I, I disengaged from people. I did. I I felt that always. Every time I made a comment about something theological, if it could just be about as, as innocuous as Luther, I always felt like there was they were ready to strike at me and ready to strike against my person for no particular reason. Um, and that, for me, cultivating the sense of the, what, what Howard is talking about here, you know, it, it was a deep resentment for, for being who I was in those kind of situations. Um, Jim, please. I'm having a hard time uh, thinking about how the oppressed could be responsible for their own fear. Uh, I, Susan, you sent around those four uh, videos. I watched them. Uh, they, they broke my heart. They, they enraged me. And I don't know how many of you saw them, but uh, they were very, very powerful, especially the young black woman who, 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 whose rage was uh, almost uncontrollable, but she spoke very eloquently about being black in this country for four over 400 years and what it's done to her. And, you know, we all know people, black people, every black boy has received the talk from their parents. They get the talk and we all know what it is. I don't have to say what it is. We all know what it is because it, it is so pervasive. And uh, we have a lot to do in our society yeah. and, and especially the church. Uh, you know, the, 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 the church has used a lot of fear uh, to, to, to maintain its power. I call it the protection racket, like the mafia did. Believe in Jesus and uh, you go to heaven. Don't and you go to hell. Well, that's tremendous power that, that have been exerted over people through the ages, the, the con of eternal life. That, that's all it is, is a con job. Uh, and, and I would like to know, you know, uh, Howard never called himself a religious and he, and he would refuse to be put in boxes. Well, that's sort of the way I am. Uh, God is too, is, a mis, is mysterious. You can't put him in a box, even though we try to with that thing we call from the fourth century called the creed, 
that's uh, it's the silliest thing I've ever read, but that's me. Thank you, Jim. Others, other thoughts? Uh, Tom, and then after Tom, we'll go to the next chapter. Yeah, I, I kind of building on some of Jim's points. Um, I was kind of struck by the way you structured the question because at, at, at sort of first read, my response is, well, isn't that kind of like blaming the victim? Um, and I realize Thurman, is, a part of what he's doing is um, trying to give agency to uh, people to um, understand that while someone might be able to harm me with physical violence, that I can have a life inside myself that in, in essence cannot be reached or destroyed by someone else. I get that. But I think that there's a, and, and, and I think this, in, in some ways, this is a wake up call for the church that um, we also need to be aware of the ways in which the church in the name of preaching the gospel um, uh, has in one way or another um, oppressed or damned people uh, who were um, perhaps not in the dominant group, what it, however that gets defined historically. Um, and one of the things that struck me early on in this particular publication was the um, terminology around mission. And I have long struggled with what in the in the in the functioning of the body of Christ, what is missionary work? And I have, after years of struggling with this, and this just really came up to the surface for me in reading this, is that first and foremost, we serve the needs of people in the world then maybe we preach as in talk or discuss the gospel. But first we must live the gospel by caring for the needs of people in the world. Thank you, Tom. And I think the gospel I, I, every day, use words only when necessary. Yes. So I, that's, so a couple, a couple of remarks. So Howard, Howard doesn't let anyone off the hook. That's that's been that's been the difficult the difficult challenge of anyone, be it oppressed, uh, be it people of color or white people. When they read Howard, this particular work of Howard, he doesn't leave anyone off the hook. So hence that the sense in which you ask, you know, that the way that the phrasing of that question, it seems like you're, you're you seem to be putting the blame. For, on people of color for, for their own experience, the experience of fear. And I say that because as we get to deception, that, that becomes a much stronger accent. But that's because what Howard is trying to do is to say, these are all defense mechanisms that you've had to be put in in this kind of a society. Um, and, and think again, Howard is really thinking about, I have American GIs that have just come back from World War II and they cannot participate in society. They're still considered to be these kind of, a, these, these, these less than humans in, in, in all the legal sense of the phrase. So for Howard is trying to say, 
there have been some mechanisms that even our, our, our boys that have come back from the war that they've had to learn. And that we ourselves, as, uh, at, in this kind of a society, we kind of breathe that. And we kind of, we kind of use these things. In, and it's not because there's any ill will on the, on the part of the disinherited. It's just what that's the disinherited do that to survive. This is all survive while Howard wants us to thrive. How do you realize yourself? So let me get back to here, right? So, so for Howard, he, he says, let's go to deception. Deception is as old as time. It's just a part of nature. You can go out and you can see, you know, every sort of animal. He talks about the hawk, right? The hawk blinks his eyes. He tries to find birds that are, are, are alive and then some birds play dead. And he says, kids know this technique. Um, that's the way in which the Ezekiel himself used that same technique of deception. And so he, he, what he wants to put this at is he says, look, religion isn't immune to this. Religion has in itself been a, a way in which the oppressed have, 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 have engaged with deep spiritual either uh, insight in order to protect themselves. And so he brings, there's this, there's this story that he talks about, um, about in, on pages 50 and 51, the oldest, he says, the oldest Negro spirituals deal with deception. And it's the song, I got shoes, you got shoes, all God's children got shoes. When we get to heaven, we're going to put on our shoes and shout all over God's heaven, heaven, heaven. So, in a sense, what he's trying to say is, look, there's what, what Howard is saying is, look, that when, when faced with the fact that, that, that slaves were Christian and their masters were Christian, uh, they were in a dilemma. How is it that we're going to be in the same place as them? And so I got shoes. They said, look, in, we'll use this sense of a song to mask the fact that we really don't think that that our masters for who they are, for what they've been doing to us, are going to be in heaven. And this is where he, he, he gets, he continues on. He says, look, this is the, the, these enslaved people would look up in the mansions where their masters would live and said, everyone's talking about heaven, ain't going there. Essentially, they're not going there uh, because that's their, we can't live in the same place. There can't be fellowship between the two of us. It's what, what he's saying in, 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 in what deception is, is kind of pernicious, it's that it really, really deals with is the question of integrity, uh, of, of integrity in the sense of I as a person in all aspects of who I am, I am one presentable person and I am living and acting in reality as one person. I don't have to partition myself out in order to survive. And so Howard says, there's, there, there are alternatives for us. There's alternatives to deception, right? You can just say, look, as he says, there's no question of honesty and dealing with each other for there's no sense of community. He would say, the first thing is, look, this is just how the way things are. The one way you can live in this society is to say, there's no point in being honest. There's no point in really speaking to ourselves the truth um, and we'll just take it as it is and and he says that's not really an adequate way because the more that we are unable to be honest with each other and live in a sense of honesty the more that we begin to believe the lack of honesty that we have so essentially you become dishonest um, he says okay there's another way um, and it's more of the way of compromise so in a sense, you, 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 you take a similar approach. You say, look, society, there's going to be inequities. Um, but rather than say, oh, well, that because of the inequities, I won't be honest. Howard says, no, because of inequities, I have to learn to compromise. I have to, I have to find ways to just survive. I have to find tactics that will just make it so I can, I can, I can keep my head up, but not too high. And so for him... Um, in, in, page, in page 37, it says, it's safe to say that the common attitude taken toward these deceptions have to do with survival, that have to do with survival is that they are amoral. 
the moral question is never raised. Um, and, and Howard says, there is, another, there is another way. And it's the way of, as he says in page 59, of a complete and devastating sincerity. Um, it's a sincerity that you say, I have to be truthful. I have to say how things are, no matter what the cost it's going to be for my survival. Um, and that's what he says. He says on page 60, emphasis upon an unwavering sincerity points up at once the major challenge of Jesus to the disinherited and the power of his most revolutionary appeal. He's saying, in a sense, it, a way for the disinherited to really live in community is to, is to basically take Jesus's advice on oaths. He says, let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. Ye have heard it, ye have heard, ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil. So Howard says that this sincerity is such that it shows your understanding again that God is in control, that the only thing that one ought to really be considerate of is of the presence of God. Um, and, and understanding this and being aware of this changes the way that we relate to one another. Um, and so he says on, on page 62, in the presence of an overwhelming sincerity on the part of the disinherited, the dominant themselves are caught with no defense, with the edge taken away from the sense of prerogative and from the status upon which impregnability rests. So what he's trying to say is this, once we get the awareness that we are going to be utterly true to who God has made us to be, then there is the awareness that I have been made in the image of God. I have dignity. I do not need to, to succumb to these tactics where I can't speak my truth. And that's a truth of how I relate in society. So, what this brings up, I think, is the question here. Does true honesty break down the barriers between people? Um, that, for me, is a question I'm always struggling with. So what do you think of Howard's response? Did you agree, in a sense? Or, did you, or how do you understand when Howard basically says, true honesty is going to break down the issues between people groups? Uh, Inda. I, I may be speaking in an a uninformed way, but it seems to me that it takes more than just honesty. It, it, honesty is like acknowledging that a barrier exists. Honesty is acknowledging that there are injustices and inequities. But I think it takes a bit of common cause recognizing that by hurting someone else you're hurting yourself that recognizing that a sin a hit to someone else is a hit to me i have my own ways reasons for thinking this when i was five years old i was spanked rather thoroughly for using the wrong water fountain i grew up in the segregated south there were barriers on everything and they were physical visible barriers my parents who grew up uh, in very poor circumstances, I literally lived on the wrong side of the tracks. Uh, the things that were done to isolate the colored people in our community also isolated us. And my father was extremely vocal about saying, this isn't right, but I still got spanked. <laughs> Thank you, Inda, for sharing. I, I think you're, I think I, this is where I think this particular dis, this description of Howard's a little lacking. Um, I know he's trying to, to, to describe what, how deception looks like, but I, I agree in, in terms of honesty and sincerity, 
that I don't think that's the strong enough impetus to create community. Like that's, that's where Howard is saying that the issue is this community in community. The reason why we're having these issues is our community can't be honest with each other. But just because I say the truth doesn't mean that I bought people into the fact that we have to now be in an honest and, and sincere uh, life together. Um, so I think you're right. There's, I think there's something else that has to be there. Um, and this is, I think, one of those, the weak chapters of Howard. Any other thoughts? Uh, Jim. Uh, Pastor Derb uh, talked about the baggage of the institutional church and in last Sunday's sermon that we have to carry with us. And the baggage that I see, an example, I was at a global mission event and uh, the, the Bishop Hansen was there. This is many years ago. I, I don't know, doesn't matter how many years ago, but it was the ELCA with, with Mark Hansen, the Bishop was there and he was addressing us. And there was a lot of word salad, just a lot of words. And we weren't saying much. And me being me, I raised my hand and I said, uh, Bishop, as we sit here, there are more black men in prison than there are in college. What am I going to tell my grandchildren when they say to me, granddad, what did you do when all this was going on? That there's more black men in prison than there are in college. How could that be? What am I supposed to tell them? What am I supposed to say our church did about it? When, you know, when, I, when we look at the George Floyd thing, where I've said this so many times, I'm a broken record, where there's all these Lutherans in Minnesota and we are dead silent on it. We, do, we Lutherans said not one word about what was going on up there. That's, if we're gonna be honest, we have to acknowledge the, 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 the gaping problems that we should be addressing. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Randy, I see you. Uh, do you see me two times or once? Uh, we see you two times. Well, I, I've spiked the water and everybody's seeing double. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the only person here. But I have a twin brother. He's on my right. He always says, says the same thing I'm saying. But uh, I was on a cell phone. I got on a computer. I forgot to turn off one of those. But uh, I remember when I was, sometimes I think about what we've been talking about. And for some reason, my mind always goes back to the past. And I, I kind of wish it would go forward to the future. Because we really can't, can't live in the past. We can only live in the future. But our experiences come from the past. And I, I recall when I was about 10 years old and went to the local Dairy Queen in a small town. And I remember a black person went to the, uh, the window. And I remember the, the owner shut, shut down the, uh, the window and wouldn't serve you. And uh, and about six months ago, I went back to the same place where now this, this establishment is run by a black lady. And I thought about when I walked in the door and I said, you know what? What about if I walked in and they say, you can't come in because you're white. But they didn't do that to me. They didn't shut the door on me. So little things like that come in my mind. And I... I have to say that uh, we only can move forward from that and find out ways and ways to move forward. And, and I don't, I don't have all the answers. I got more questions than answers. Uh, I, but I also say that it's been years and years in the making that we as as people, you know, church or not church, should have been dealing with that. It's always been pressed aside. You know, let's sweep it aside. Let's put them in jail. Let's put up some fences. Uh, let's create our own schools. There's a series of events. You know, she has slavery's over. 
but it's a series of events that keep on happening. And I, it, I do it myself. You know, the black neighbors, you know, where I grew up, uh, now it used to be a white, it was a white neighbor and I was a black neighbor. When he comes in and uh, I talk to him, but I never invite him in the house because I go back to the old rules. You know, I grew up there. There are other rules. You don't, you don't invite black people to your house. Now, of course, I do it here. But when I go back to Louisiana, a small town, I don't do it because my white neighbors on the other side are going to say, hey, look, he's dealing with blacks now. So there's some bit of, we don't want to do it because we're scared that maybe we're going to be retaliated against in our own group. And it's still there. So, and I might, I do have some, I'm sure I have some, some of that in me that's totally not gone, you know, but my point is that, you know, we, we kind of working on it. I'm glad we are. That's all I have to say. <clears throat> no, but right. I mean, Randy, you make an excellent point. I mean, what, what Howard is, is trying to get people to understand is just the simple person that has to deal with, with day in and day out of being, being black in the segregated society, right? There's this, there's, there, there, are, there are things in the way, the, the, the way that people relate on a day-to-day -day basis. Howard is saying, we have to attend to really the sense of fear, the sense of why is it that, that, that white people and black people just can't, at, at least in his time, why can't we just live together? He go and think of it, Howard has this church in which it's an integrated church and he's like, this is an example of how America could be. Why is it that it isn't happening? You know, and, and it's because I think Howard, what Howard is trying to say is there's, there's something within the psyche of, of, of the disinherited and the psyche of the oppressed uh, that makes it so it's just, it, there's an inability to be intimate, to be in community. Um, and so that's where I'll switch to our last section here where Howard says really hatred. He goes, he goes it's, it's thinking again, he's just writing out of, uh, really post-World War II and, and his first example is, look, war, there are going to be these opportunities where there is a cultivation of hatred. Um, and he says, he, says, he says this, that hatred is something of which to be ashamed unless it provides for us a form of validation and privilege. And he will spend the rest of his chapter really describing how is it that when, when, when hatred begins to be developed within um, a lack of fellowship, when that, when, because there isn't an intimacy between, between people of color and white people, there's, there's a sense in which hatred can come up. What happens when, when that hatred finally takes root and starts growing and, and blossoming and, and developing? Um, within a person. And then from there, what happens is when you try to relate to other people. So he says on page, in, in page 66, where context devoid of, of general, when there are contexts devoid of genuine fellowship, so when we just don't have that kind of a friendship, such contexts stand in immediate candidacy for hatred. So what he's saying is there's, there are opportunities for us to hate people. War is, a, war is one of those ways, but even more so, uh, the opportunity to hate comes when there isn't a sense of community, when there isn't a sense in which we live together uh, and breathe together and find, and we see each other as equal partners. And so he, he also says, look, thinking of it that way, there's, there's because there isn't genuine fellowship, there isn't a, a way of understanding other folks, the disinherited, the, the uh, or understanding white people because there is an unsympathetic understanding of our experiences. And so there is a, there's a way in which the, the lack of intimacy breeds further misunderstanding, further, further lack of, you know, why, why should I be concerned about these issues? Why should these issues affect me? Um, and he, he, he makes this, this, very, this very poignant story where he was, he was um, on a, a, a train ride from Chicago to Memphis, and he is in the presence of this elderly woman who, when he looked at her, when he, he looked at him and then looked at the porter said, what is that thing? 
uh, doing, what is that doing in this car? Meaning what is Howard doing in this car? And again, what he's trying to say is, look, there's, because we, there wasn't a sense of, of contact, there wasn't a greeting, there wasn't a sense that, that we, we can be friends, right? Then there is, there's a breeding of animosity and um, an understanding and, or a lack of wanting to understand uh, these situations. And so what he says is this, this hatred as it begins to take root in a person, um, he says this, hatred in the mind and the spirit of the disinherited is born out of great bitterness. A bitterness that is made possible by sustained resentment, which is bottled up until it distills us essence of vitality, giving to the individual in whom this is happening a radical and fundamental basis for self-realization. Essentially, and what he's saying is, you know, hatred isn't just something that that is comes from that comes from us being unable to be with one another, but it but in a sense, when hatred finally takes root in someone's heart, it, it, it's an animating force. It, it, it makes it so that people can be realized, but in a way that ultimately, as he says later on, ultimately it's like a wildfire. While it can help you stabilize your ego, it ultimately consumes you uh, because ultimately it's just like in the story of Moby Dick, right? Um, where, you know, Ahab is really trying to, to destroy the white whale. And he says this, his hair is disheveled, his face is furrowed, and there is a fever in his blood that only the conquest of the white whale can cure. In effect, he says to the lightning, you may destroy this vessel, you may dry up the bowels of the sea, you may consume me, but I can still be ashes. So, what to do? What does Jesus have to say about this, 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 this deep resentment that, 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 that comes out of this, this environment? He, he basically says Jesus ultimately rejects hatred. And next week, we'll talk a little bit more about why he rejects hatred. Where is the, the source of that? And that's ultimately love, Jesus's love ethics. And so he he ends his chapter on hatred this way. He says, Jesus rejected hatred uh, because he saw that hatred meant death to the mind, death to the spirit, death to communion with his father. He affirmed life and hatred was the great denial. To him, it was clear. And here's one of his poems. Thou must not make division. Thy mind, heart and soul and strength must ever search to find the way by which the road to all men's needs of thee must go. This is the highway of the Lord. Um, so I think something for us to, to really ponder is, um, can the lack of fellowship and lack of opportunity in place for people to engage in warmth and genuineness be a contributing factor to the germination of hatred? Is that the only reason why people hate? Um, I don't know if that's the only reason why. I don't think that's the only excuse why. But that's something for us to think about. Really, when, when we don't have friendships, we don't have intimacy with people who don't look like us, are there, is that seeds for hatred? Is that seeds in which that can be developed? I don't know if I agree with Thurman that way. I think there's something else there that, that, that's added to the whole composition of hatred. Um, but yes, so for next week, we will be discussing really about Jesus and the, dis the Jesus and the disinherited in this way. Who is Jesus? Jesus for Howard is the disinherited. And he says, well, what does this disinherited one have to really give to us? And he says, there's this love ethic that Jesus gives to us that really addresses fear, deception, and hatred at the heart of our segregated society. Um, and so that's what we'll be discussing next week. Any questions, any thoughts, any last minute questions or comments? Well, I think the tie between fear and, um, and, and the prox lack of proximity is a big part of, of the problem. Mm -hmm.
Karen uh, George. Bridget and then Lisa. I, I was just going to say that I think we really, uh, Randy hit the nail on the head when he was talking about what he would do in Houston and what he would do in, in Louisiana. And we are really uh, sensitive to our peers. We talk about teenagers, we're all like that. And I broke my mother's heart when I joined Christ the King Church. My mother stayed at Augustana and it hurt her deeply that we rationalized. We had a daughter going into confirmation and they didn't have a pastor who could really, you know, do justice to that. I can give you a dozen rationalizations. It was, we had been in the church, in, that congregation and we loved it although we we moved from Colorado Springs to Houston and um I it was a rational decision I don't know that we had we had nothing against going back to Augustana but we just felt more comfortable in joining Christ the King, which was close to our house, a little closer than Augustana. Have a Richmond goes right through and turns into Wheeler. And anyway, we need to really examine our day-to-day -day decisions. That's my true confession for tonight. <laughs> Thank you, Bridget. Lisa, please. Just kind of a concluding remark. Uh, five years or so ago, Ibram Kendi wrote a book called Stamp from the Beginning, The Definitive History of Racial Ideas in America. And he wrote, hate and ignorance have not driven the history of racist ideas in America. Racist policies have driven the history of racist ideas in America. It's kind of food for thought. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lisa. I think I kind of wanted to say something similar to that, but you, I wanted to keep it sufficiently open-ended, but you're, I think you're right. That's where, again, because Howard is so focused on the interior, in his mind, the interior soul, addressing the interior soul first in order to change society, because that's his focus, this question of, of, of policy, of what needs to be done to change, what particular policies are at fault, that's not really something that Howard entirely addresses as part of his corpus. His corpus is always, what, is it, what does it mean for me as a human being that hungers, that thirsts for a sense of God and for an experience of God? What are the impediments that I can have in experiencing God? And for him, the massive impediment is this reality of racism and segregation and, and white privilege. So those are the main things that, that in America and really, I think he would be as expansive to say anywhere in the world where there are, where there are people that are oppressed, um, that they face that. They face these, inter these realities that have interior significance. So for next week, um, read from the preface to page 25 and then from um, page 79 to the end, which that would include basically the epilogue. And that will really, wrap up Howard, at least for us. There's much more Howard I recommend you read. Um, but next week we'll be talking again a little bit more about the life of Howard, a um, little bit more about the Church for the Fellowship of All Peoples, and as well ending really with what is the, what's the bookends of this book, and that is the person of Jesus. So I will be sending um, the PowerPoint with Beverly to you all. So you'll be receiving that hopefully next week. Um, and I'm so glad that you took the time to be with us tonight and uh, discuss this really important work. Uh, it's one of my personal favorites. I, this thing has helped me get through so many situations in my life. It's one of my favorites. So we'll just, I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna stop recording here.